So on today's episode, we're going to be talking about evolutionary brain psychology. It's all around a book called Unleash Your Primal Brain by Tim Ash. It's a great episode. You don't want to miss it. Do stay tuned. So welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast show. I'm your host, Kune Campbell. And now this interview you're about to listen to is a is an interview I had with Tim Ash. I talk a lot about him in there, but essentially he released a book, right? And this book is about, I personally read it. it it's about the brain. And he talks about like the evolution of the brain. As in, it gives you a real breakdown of how the brain works. And then it takes you to the journey of how the human brain evolved while giving you tips about how our brain actually works. It's one of those books that are not huge to read. At the same time, they're no fillers, essentially. It's just dense with information, dense with stories that link you through to the information, through to what it's trying to, to describe. And it's really about understanding the brain a lot better. And it's got references from several other authoritative sources, which he intentionally did not sort of mention. So this conversation you're about to listen to is me drilling him about certain parts of the book I enjoyed, certain facts in the book I was trying to get him to expand upon. Tim, if you don't know who he is, he's a conversion rate optimizer from you know, the 2000s and he consulting for, for the likes of Google, Facebook, Expedia in that time. And over time he was running conferences, running an agency, and now he is more or less a public speaker and author. And this book for me is one of those, it's kind of book that I aspire to want to write because I don't want to write a book that's contemporary and very focused on this time that we live in. I want to write a book that if, you know, my grandchildren, you know, read it, they, they get context and a lot of information, you know, off the back of it. And it's one of those kind of books that really goes through how the brain works from the information we have now, essentially. And then there are many applications you could use in various, you know, disciplines, whether it's behavioral, you know, sciences you're into, whether it's marketing you're into, whether it's even crafting copy, it has some, some principles that will teach you how we think as human beings and how the brain actually works. And then you could use this, you know, this information as a superpower towards building your community, towards harnessing cooperation from, you know, groups of people you're working with or, you know, groups of people you associate with. It's that good. So enjoy this episode. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation I had with Tim. If you are watching this on YouTube, give this particular episode a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button also. If you run iOS, which we talk about in this conversation with Tim, definitely leave us reviews, support us, you know, join our Facebook group. I appreciate you guys and, you know, continue to enjoy these episodes. Enjoy listening to this one. It's a really interesting conversation and it segues from the tactics, tactics, tactics we typically talk about on this show, it really is, for me, it's, it's more like a mindful episode and it's a play of words, you know, um, pardon the pun, pun not intended. It's really mindful, it's considered, um, Tim is, is calm and it just gives us that top level of how we think, how we behave as people. Enjoy and I shall catch you on the other side. Cheers. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast show. I'm your host, Kunle Campbell, and this is the podcast dedicated to growth in the direct-to-consumer selling space. Now, if you work in marketing at an e-commerce business or a founder, I'm going to pretty much help you sell more directly to your customers. Now, each week on this episode, I interview an expert, a founder of a direct-to-consumer e-commerce business or a representative from a best-in-class e-commerce SaaS product. And we're pretty much focused on helping you, um, our listeners, you 2Xers, to improve e-commerce growth metrics such as conversions, average order value, repeat customers, your audience size, and ultimately sales. Um, our remit you know, to you, our promise really is to help you get smarter with selling um, through your meaningful brands. I like to think you all are building out meaningful, you know, brands that are, you know, long lasting and really care, you know, for, for, for the marketplace. Now, today, 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 you know, when you 
look up to someone, you know, um, where you, you attend all his webinars, um, you read his books, um, and you just, you're a sponge to concepts he brings up because they just resonate with you. Well, my host today, whose name is Tim Ash, um, that was my sort of relationship with him from afar back in the, the late 2000s, you know, when I was kickstarting my, my digital marketing career. And the reason why it was, you know, back in those days, I was very much <clears throat> involved in like search, you know, search marketing. And I used to wonder why, like, if I drove traffic to particular websites, you know, why some websites did better than the other. And he came up with a blueprint on landing pages back in the days. And, and that just, you know, the principles, I think there were like laws of landing page design. I, I remember attending, you know, several webinars and I did, and every time I applied those principles to the landing page I was building that at the time I was doing like lead generation, um, bang on, uh, they just work. They, the conversions just improved. So Tim is someone I really respect. He is an acknowledged authority on evolutionary psychology and digital marketing. Um, he's a sought after international speaker and a best-selling author for the book we're going to talk about, Unleash Your Primal Brain and Landing Page Optimization. Um, I had a copy of Landing Page Optimization and I gifted it to, to someone, um, to someone special who was actually upcoming. Um, and you know, you know, Tim has been mentioned in several publications. He's worked with <laughs> Facebook, American Express, Canon, you get the gist, and Google, Google Expedia. Um, and he's created over a billion dollars in, in value for, for these companies. Um, and there's not much I could say, but just welcome, welcome, Tim. Welcome, Tim. Oh, thanks, Gunley. It's a, it's my pleasure to be with you. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, should we do a quick intro? Do you, do you want to do a quick intro? Um, and, and, and then we'll move into your, your book, which I've read. Yeah. Well, you, you've covered it pretty well. I uh, ran a, a digital optimization agency called site tuners. It's now in the mm -hmm. capable hands of my business partners. I'm no longer active in it, but, uh, we worked with both huge companies and all the way down to nimble startups to improve the effectiveness of their websites. And as you mentioned, I've written a couple of, uh, books on landing page optimization. This is the one I think you're referencing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I ran a conference series called conversion conference. It's now oh, called yes. digital growth unleashed in the US and Europe every year. Uh, and that was the first conference to focus on conversion rate optimization and making websites more effective. Yeah. So I have a broad background in digital marketing, but the last couple of years I've been focusing on my keynote speaking, uh, solo marketing advisory, uh, created a new LinkedIn learning course on neuromarketing recently. And Senna. of course, uh, came out this, this past pandemic year with my new book, Unleash Your Primal Brain. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, you were the you were part of the first wave of you know conversion rate optimization as we know it today. Um, you 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 know your ideas you know really really strengthened the industry and made it what it is you know today. Now um now I I read your book you know on on unleash um you know the primal brain and my expectations were kind of like. Initially, my expectations were like, this is going to be, this is going to be neuromarketing, you know, it's going to be neuromarketing brain where you're, you're talking about um, neuroscience and applying it to branding and or marketing or, or conversions. And it mm. completely wasn't that. It, it, it was a, an, a deeply researched book on how the brain works and how to be a better person. So the final chapters were my favorite, um, mm. you know, as in it was, it was like a double edged sword. You could use it to rule the world or you could, you know, you could use it for, for good or evil towards the end, you know, especially the parts around like, um, I think it was the, the, the sociology parts where they, uh, that's not the, how you, you framed it. I think it was like, um, social circles or something or social network, mm, hyper social, Hi yeah. hyper social network. Exactly. Um, that I, I found very, very, very brilliant. But I, I guess my my question is, why did you write the book? It's a timeless book, 
for that you know your grandchildren will read and get it you know because it's yeah it's it's not in the time it's it's not about a hack or a you know it's it's not specific here it's it's a science it's a, it, in a true sense you know of it it's a textbook at the same time it's like a hack textbook in in a way well you don't i don't want to scare people i i no. very deliberately wrote it to be in um dramatic language with anecdotes mm-hmm. with stories with vivid uh, memories that you're going to form from reading the book. So it's not a typical popular science book where there's a bunch of footnotes and tables and citations. Mm-hmm. Actually, there's absolutely no footnotes in the book. And that That's was true. a very conscious choice. And so it's really what I wanted to do was break down the silos between behavioral economics, psychology, neuromarketing. Everyone's got their own perspective on it. And I would just want to say, look, the red thread through all of this, the underlying theme is evolutionary psychology. So if you want to understand what human beings are, we have to retrace the whole evolutionary arc to see where we picked up different types of behavior. A lot of them Mm -hmm. we share with very early forms of life with insects and reptiles. Others are bizarrely and distinctly human. And I cover those, like you say, at the end, when I talk about culture or storytelling and things that are unique to human beings, but you have to understand the whole arc in order to do that. And as you mentioned, my goal was to divorce this from strictly digital marketing or conversion rate optimization, which was my specialty. So this book is a a bit of a chameleon. If you read it with a business blinders on, then you'll get a lot of value as a marketer, as a salesperson, as a leader. But you can also just as easily read it for personal relationships or self-improvement because it describes basic human nature. Very cleverly, you know, at, at that. Um, yeah, uh, I found it really, really interesting. You know, you start with um, with, with the story about, um, you know, the uh, you know ancestors in the savannah and, you know, their thinking and, and you, you link it through, you know, to, through, through to, you know, the understanding of the brain. Okay, so the book starts out with um, with a big lie. Um, could you expand on on, on, on that, on, on what you mean by, by the big lie? Yes. Uh, we, we live, or at least I live, in a largely Western society, and uh, our thought goes all the way back f- uh, through the Industrial Revolution, the Renaissance, to uh, the ancient Greeks. And there's been a bias for over 2,000 years that basically says, look, what makes us better, quote unquote, than other animals is that we're rational, reasoning beings. And so if only we could tame those wild horses of our emotions and we could all be like Mr. Spock on the Star Trek uh, (laughs) movies, then we'd all be better off. And that's a big lie. In fact, the rational brain, quote unquote, the conscious part of the mind doesn't even make decisions. Mm -hmm. All of our decisions are emotional. And I mean that literally, you can't decide without emotions. All the conscious brain does is gives us options. But to narrow down that infinite amount of choice down to something actionable, that's the job of emotions. And Mm -hmm. only the strongest emotions driven by our strongest survival imperatives get activated. And so if we think we're kind of rational creatures, we're way off the mark. And my whole purpose with this book is to make you understand your true emotional nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... You know the science. You know is 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 really about um, you know coming from the premise that we don't know. It's it's really an observation. You know, um, it, it's a principle. It, it's a, it's it's a it's based on observation, and then we we make conclusions off the back of you know testing and and, and observing. How do you mm-hmm. observe the the emotions? You know, how how do we sort of is it something tangible, and and, and how do we tame our emotions? Um, and, as compared to logic, which is very tangible. Well, I think that uh, you can observe emotions. And right now is almost a golden age of understanding the brain. And there are many perspectives, as I mentioned, behavioral economists can tell how we act given certain incentives, risk reward setups. Uh, Sociologists can see attitudes and survey people. Uh, Neuroscientists can see real-time brain scans and what's actually going on inside of the brain as we react to different kinds of stimuli or input. So we can kind of crack the skull open a bit and start poking around inside of it. So uh, that stuff is very quantifiable. Uh, We also know a lot more about brain anatomy and how different brain systems interact, the ones that are fear-driven, the ones that are 
automatic responses, the ones that are shaped by our need to be part of a cultural tribe and so on. So we can actually see those parts of the brain getting activated. This is all, everything in my book, I'd say I got it 95% right. It's the current state of the art about the thinking. Everything in there, despite the fact that it's not technical, has been validated and researched and studied. Mm -hmm. Mm. You, you also talked about like the the four main systems of you know the human brain um you know basic survival um automatic responses conscious movements and actions and then social you know behavior planning do, do you mind expanding on, on that because it, it seems very evolutionary as, as you alluded to yeah absolutely so think of the brain as being a band-aid on top of a fix on top of an adjustment and on top of a upgrade and so on all those more ancient parts are still there we're just patching around them and augmenting them so the basic level where our brain helps control things like respiration and digestion you you probably weren't thinking about keeping your heart beating last night as you slept but uh, your brain did that for you so so that's the keeping the lights on level and then there's automatic reactions. So for example, you, you touch the hot stove by accident, you'll pull your finger away. You don't have to think, hmm, that's a strange smell emanating from the tip of my finger. Perhaps I should move it. No, you just do it. And if you're dumb enough to repeat that mistake, you'll have the same automatic response of pulling your finger away. So that's the reactive reptilian part. Um, there's simple. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Clavio is a growth marketing platform that powers over 25,000 online businesses. Clavio understands every single customer interaction and empowers brands to create more personalized marketing moments. Listen, analyze, and act on your customer data with Clavio. Visit clavio.com forward slash 2x. sorts of methods for you know, operating systems that don't require any adjustment. For example, if something is moving and it's smaller than me, it's food and I'm going to chase it. If something is moving and it's bigger than me, I'm food and I'm going to run away. Mm -hmm. So th those kind of automatic responses kick in always. And then above that is this level of, that we share with mammals, which is the uh, both memory and the emotional brain. Now mammals had to congregate in herds and it introduced a whole other set of problems uh, we're individually weaker, but we survive in the herd. So we now have to manage our tribal dynamics. Mm. And we have to uh, remember, you know, things that help us with that and other things that hurt us. So we want to basically maximize our social benefits of being in the herd while minimizing the social costs of being mm. in the herd. And that requires memory and to remember things that were good and to try to avoid things that were bad in the past and to carry that around as a memory. Mm -hmm. And then finally, for mo the most sophisticated social creatures like people, our most developed part of the brain, what makes us different is the neocortex or the cerebral cortex, and that's there to model our social relationships. Mm -hmm. So we have the largest group size of any animal where there are unique individuals, about 100 to 200 people. And we want to mm -hmm. keep those relationships clear. So for example, if I do a great job on this podcast, Kunle is going to recommend me to Fred and Fred's going to get me to keynote at his conference. And to be able to model complex things like that and up them, update them in real time, that's what the reasoning and planning brain is really for. It's not for building microwave ovens or sending landers to Mars or any of that mm -hmm. stuff. As soon as we stop doing two plus two equals four, we default back to social reasoning and planning our social world. Mm, and, and I think the key word there, is if, what I picked up from, from the book was a cooperation, the fact that we cooperate, um, you know, through culture and, and language. And, and I found that, you know, very, very, very interesting. And then you, you whittled down this, you didn't, you said not to simplify things, um, you, you, you kind of split it out, you know, to, for, for better understanding to like the primal brain, and the conscious brain. And and that right. just, you know, yeah, it was very, very interesting. Could you describe the, the primal brain, which is the name of the book, and the, the, the conscious brain? Yes. So think of it this way. The primal brain works automatically 24-7, literally every second of the day. It processes massive amounts of information. It can do it instantly, and it uh, never gets tired. 
Whereas the conscious brain uh, starts the day if you have good blood sugar and you had some food doing pretty well, um, doing things, directing your attention to things that the automatic system can't handle. And then it gets tired over the course of the day. So your, your emotional self-regulation, your ability to make good decisions, your judgment, all of that goes out the window and by the end of the day is depleted. So it's very limited resource. So think about the conscious brain. Think about all of the information coming in this second. It could be the pressure of the chair on your butt right now as you sit in a seat. It could be uh, the colors and the changes in your visual field. It's precipitation, which is the relationship of every joint of your body in space. It's why when we eat a salad, we don't usually stick a fork in our forehead uh, because we know where all of those joints are. So there's this trillions of inputs every day and the conscious brain, the, un the primal brain rather, runs all of that automatically and tirelessly and ignores most of it because most of it is not something that impacts your survival. So, sorry, I can't hear you, Kunli. How, so how, how does memory play um, in, in both parts of the brain, in the primal versus the, the conscious brain? Um, mm. Yeah, it's a great question. Memory, the people have a lot of misconceptions about memory. One of the myths that I bust in the book is this notion. I don't know if you've ever seen that science fiction series, Black Mirror, but there's an episode where you can ha kind of do a life rewind and mm -hmm. store somebody's whole consciousness in a computer and then just rewind back to the parts you want to see. I've seen that. Well, yeah. that idea is, an, is impossible. You couldn't possibly store all of that information. The, one of the key things to understand about the brain is it's an ignoring machine. Most things get ignored. They don't even get actively considered. They don't get put into your memory. And then if it's an important memory, you sleep on it, then you have a chance of storing it into kind of longer term memories. Mm -hmm. But even if something ends up there, over time it's going to fade and it's going to get distorted and it's going to get overlaid with new memories every time you sleep again. So basically there's no such thing as an accurate memory. Mm. And most things are just this kind of bizarre distorted echo of our past. And in order to form strong memories, we need to have stuff that's very salient, that's very vivid, usually mm. multi-sensory experiences ac accompanied by strong emotions. That's what makes things cut through and stick in our minds. And that's why that, that, that for me, that, that point you made in, in terms of like, you know, the combination of experiences, emotive experiences with, um, with, with, with occurrences to create memory, um, just, it, it kind of brought my marketing mind, you know, in, you know, in, into the mix. And I guess my question is, how does brand recall in, in advertising? We're just going to segue a little bit into marketing and advertising. Sure. How does this play into like brand recall? Because we you know, so many brands are fighting, vying for the attention of, of people. Um, so, so how can, you know, um, you know, marketers use, you know, that bit of, you know, having a bit of emotion, novelty and creating a multi-sensory experience in order to form, you know, memory um, in, in their, in their advertising, especially when um, it's predominantly digital, you know, um, how, how do you deliver that multi-sensory and who do you think is doing it really well? Well, I don't know that er anybody can deliver that or everybody can deliver that. If you want to start with a brand, I think that goes much more to our social natures and our tribal allegiances. Uh, for example, you might be in, I don't know, what kind of phone do you have? Do you have an iPhone? I iOS, iPhone, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, I have a Samsung you know, uh, I, because I like to get work done. <laughs> and I just started a civil war, right? All of your <laughs> listeners that are Apple loyalists are going, oh, that guy's so full of crap. I hate him. <laughs> Apple's the best, you know, uh -huh. even though they have fewer features, even though they're coming out with stuff later than Samsung, even though they're actually removing features and calling that an improvement and so on. So we could argue on the objective stuff, but you can't argue with people that are religious zealots, like people that own iPhones are. Um, and I'm, I'm just half joking about that, but you have to have a strong loyalty to your brand. You have to stand for something. 
And mm. by definition, that means excluding others. Mm. So if in order for a brand to be strong, it has to be uh, specialized. It has to resonate for a small group of people. Uh, and it's hard to resonate for everybody on the planet. So if you're telling me your product or service, well, it's wonderful and it can be used by all 8 billion people on the planet right now. That's not a brand. Mm. There are very few mass market brands, Coca-Cola and Sony and Apple, things like that. But really, for most of the businesses we're talking about, you need to find your tribe, understand what values they have, and only then can you tailor your messages and your products and your business model towards that. Most marketers do it backwards. They just say, we built a product, let's get out the megaphone and scream about it to anyone who's willing to listen. And that's, that's why brand messages don't land. You don't even understand who you're talking to. You haven't even picked an audience. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I guess with with repetition, you know, so the, the, the more you've invested time and, you know, um, emotional well, time into using a brand or being part of a brand, the, the, the harder it is to, to, to stop using the brand or to, to leave the brand, essentially, it gets reinforced, more or less. Yes. And, the, and your social contacts using it, the prevalence of um, following other people's lead, look, all my friends have Apple phones, too, and so mm -hmm. on. That, that's a very powerful reinforcement because uh, underneath it all, we're essentially conformists. Mm -hmm. We don't want to stick out in a social sense and be iconoclastic. Unless that's your tribe. We're the tribe of iconoclastic people. I remember when I was in high school, there was a subset of kids that would dye their hair and pierce their nose. Okay, but mm. they thought they were being so original by being in such iconoclast, but really they were all the same. They were just part of the dye your hair and pierce your nose tribe. Mm. So they were conforming within that group. Well, how do you get the attention, you know, the initial attention? Because it all, there's this trigger point that gets you in to consider and then once you consider you know a brand you try it out and then you there's this hook period and then you become a zealot you know with the community you join that community so how can sort of marketers sort of apply you know neuroscience you know all this study of the brain to in that first step of you know getting an attention and, and that's where mm. i kind of like looped it back to you know what you said around the you know the multi-century um you know experience to form stronger you know memories you know so when i'm now aware of the apple initially you know um what did you know, remember that the 1980 was it the 1984 famous apple you know think differently you know advert that that was a success in itself it was one advert that got so much attention obviously over the super bowl and you know got a lot of people to really think about apple as the alternative you know to whatever was in the market at the time yeah so there are two different spheres we have to think about as marketers in the public sphere we just want to interrupt someone and get their attention and mm -hmm. the stronger your message is there the more obnoxious it is the more it's going to get noticed uh, so it's okay to be controversial there. let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors did you know that cloud-hosted e-commerce platforms like Shopify and BigCommerce do not provide automatic backups? Rewind steps in to protect Shopify and BigCommerce stores with automatic backups. Rewind is trusted by over 25,000 stores. Install Rewind and get to test it for free over seven days. And to extend the seven day trial to 30 days, head over to rewind.io, their website and mention 2x e-commerce. There. Well, I have a problem because, you know, as I mentioned, I worked with websites a lot and making them more effective that people continue to use, marketers continue to use those tactics once you land on their website. Now, to me, that's very counterproductive because you should be very deliberate with your attention control on your own website and it should have a Zen like stillness mm -hmm. out of which the calls to action naturally arise. And you should carefully design your visual hierarchy and not bugger it up with a bunch of distractions. Mm -hmm. So out there where you're competing for my attention and to interrupt me, that's okay to use outlandish tactics and very strong, shocking stuff. Once you get them to your website, you have their undivided attention. So stop distracting them. 
That's mm. also an important principle. Mm -hmm. Funnel down makes makes a lot of sense. Okay, um, let, let's talk about um, the you know the the, the bits of your book around um, you know the the hyper social. You know, the, for me that was really really interesting um, in the sense of what distinguishes you know um, humans essentially from you know from from other animals um, from mm. a social standpoint. What what are the key pillars? Um, yeah. That's a great question. If you think about human beings, we've spread out literally to every nook and corner of this planet. And when you typically think about other animals that occupy wide ecological ranges, they adapt to them. I'll use the squirrel as an example. There are squirrels that weigh a few grams. There are squirrels that weigh a few kilograms, literally a thousand times larger. There are ones that have wings to fly between trees. There are others that hibernate in the desert heat underground in little burrows. So they've, there's some that have rotating ankles so that they can run headfirst down trees and others that don't. So there are all these physical adaptations to their environment. Human beings are essentially physically the same. The smallest pygmies are about a meter 50. The tallest people in the world, the Dutch on average, the men are about a, a meter 83. That's not a huge difference. We can have different skin colors, eye colors, features, but really our adaptation was not physical. We placed one giant bet on spreading culture. The bet was that we could learn more from our surrounding culture and tribe than we could ever recreate in a lifetime of trying to do it ourselves. And that cumulative knowledge has, of course, gotten us to where we are for better or for worse is another discussion. But the need to learn from others around us, to transmit knowledge and culture to others is at the very basic core of our nature. We're very cooperative and we're kind of self-domesticating. We need to cooperate with others and fit in and conform. Mm -hmm. There's this culture. Yeah, so what, what defines, you know, a, a culture? And the reason I'm asking is you, you have you know, villages or, you know, small ethnic groups of say tens of thousands. And then, you know, you, you have huge empires, more or less, you know, mm. the ethos of an empire. What is right? And, and this is not a, a black and white, you know, question. Um, how, what is optimal from, from, from all of your research um, for, for humans, you know, to, to thrive? Um, do, do we well, thrive better again, in smaller if you look groups? at um, where we picked up all of our evolutionary baggage, if you will, or where well, the environment we evolved for, until the last 10,000 years ago and the climate becoming a bit more stable and we developed agriculture, we were nomadic. So our tribe was, like I mentioned, maybe 100 to 200 people at most. And most of them were close relations. Mm -hmm. You, If you're in the tribe, Kunle, you were your relationship with some ambiguous cousin, nephew, uncle, father to everybody else in that group. So they shared a lot of your genes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that tribal survival was very important. And even when you talk about villages, well, that's already a settled life after the agricultural revolution. 10,000 is a huge number. So we have these kind of close clan uh, relationships. And then we have everyone else, total strangers people with whom we might never um, do business again, to see them again, to interact with them again. So we have different rules for what I call the relational sphere, which is personal, and the transactional sphere, which is for dealing with strangers. So mm -hmm. anything beyond a, a few dozen people is not your tribe. Mm -hmm. So, so in, the, in the modern world, it still replicates itself when, when we talk about um, having a circle you know, of friends, because really there's this need for belonging and validation. Um, so, so is, is that 12 number or 20 number still a threshold in, in modern life, especially in, in Well, Robin Dunbar is the, is the man that did most of this research. And he basically said the size of your cerebral cortex, which is there for, as I mentioned, processing your close social ties implies that people have a close social group of about a hundred to 200. So that's the mm -hmm. most close ties that we can have. And, me having 16,000 LinkedIn uh, connections doesn't change that at all, or mm -hmm. 30,000 Twitter followers. They're not my friends. I might have run across some of them at conferences, but unless I have an ongoing relationship, that's not in my in-group. Mm -hmm. So that, that doesn't really change. 
So what, what drives humans to want to evangelize, you know, um, their culture, you know, whatever subculture they're, they're mm. in? Um, yeah, that's a great question. If you look at uh, our past, as a, they're independent animals like crocodiles that do very well on their own. And if you look at the evolution of mammals, they're individually weaker, but by herding together into groups, they became stronger. Humans, because of culture, have taken that to the ultimate extreme. Uh, if you look at the history of human beings, it's really one group against another. And so the real question was, are you a good member of my group? Are you going to get with the program? Are you going to follow what I say? Is there going to be high group cohesion, loyalty, and so on? Those are the most important things from a cultural level. So if... If you climb up on the mast of a tall sailing ship and you say, Tim, I think the world is kind of round because on the horizon I can see a bit of a curve and everybody else on the ship says the world is flat and we're going to sail off the edge of it, you know what we'd do to you? We'd throw you off that freaking mast yeah. because you're not getting with the program. You're gumming up the works. You're putting sand in the gears, whatever you want to call it. So the need to spread the the tribal belief system without alteration and very quickly and to conform is really strong in us and we see this in politics where we sort ourselves into you know, echo chambers and bubbles and repeat the same things so it, that's a very strong inherent human need to spread the culture of the surrounding people so who you surround yourself with is the biggest determiner of what you do mm. uh, the safety of the heads of, of the head yeah and and then you also talk about like ownership um that <clears throat> basically you know um o ownership is well over possession is is linked to uncertainty of the future because you know back in the days when when we we're nomads you, you, you had to be agile you know how to be you had to be in your fit and there's so much you could you know you know carry carry around in today's world where you know pretty much almost everybody's settled you know down how wh what are your views on on possession and mm. um you know consumerism in that sense you know how, how do we fit it in and and you know do, do you think there's a place for minimalism you know in in, in that in that respect uh, well this is um you bring you bring up a great point so again our evolutionary past was nomadic it wasn't agrarian we weren't settled and so if you think about it, here you are, part of your tribe. If you had a sharp rock to cut you know, things with, you'd probably only carry one in the group because you can always pass it around. Mm -hmm. So only the most important survival items were carried, food, water, clothing, weapons, your children, because they, they were pretty helpless and had to be carried for a long time. And anything you carried had to help you survive. And even carrying another extra sharp rock and having two of them in the group, that was a tough decision because, yeah, it might be more efficient to have two of the tools, but maybe you go around the bend and there's a whole field of sharp rocks and you don't need to carry it. Or maybe you go into a desert full of sand and you never see a sharp rock again in your life. So these mm. were life and death decisions. So anything we owned, we, we valued a lot. And now that we are settled, we have houses, we have with closets, we have car trunks, we have garages, we have storage units. There's no practical limit. And so our evolutionary past is kind of misfiring and we keep acquiring stuff. A lot of people collect things, for example, or just store a bunch of crap in their storage unit that they could uh, much more easily and cheaply buy if they ever needed it again instead of paying those storage fees. But that's, again, a misfiring of our ownership instincts. And as marketers, we can take advantage of that. Anything that gives me a sense of ownership or control or to customize, to try something. When you buy a new car, the first thing they do is say, hey, get in, take it for a test drive. Exactly. It's because you're trying it on for size. And what would it be like to own this? And, and that's what those kind of marketing tactics are taking advantage of. So, so we feed into that appetite of, um, you know, for ownership, you know, and, and the more you get people Yeah, and ownership, to, it could be control, customization, control. even in a false choice. So there's experiments that say, if I sold you a raffle ticket for a dollar, but I just handed it to you versus letting you pick it out of a fan of raffle tickets. If I asked you to sell that back later, you'd want more if you... Uh, I got to pick the one out of the fan because mm -hmm. you somehow think that by picking it, 
you have more of a chance of winning or something. Mm -hmm. It's that illusion of control. We see the same thing, for example, with lotteries, where you get to pick your own numbers. Yeah. I mean, the lottery is random, but you it picking is. your birth date as your lottery number somehow makes you value it more and more likely to play the lottery. Mm -hmm. And um, this probably just as a segue, um, just the, the randomness of, you know, occurrences of things happening. And we, we, we tend to be hardwired to, um, to, to, to like surprise and not consistency, you know, in, in that, in that respect from, from a lottery standpoint. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Clavio is a growth marketing platform that powers over 25,000 online businesses. Clavio understands every single customer interaction and empowers brands to create more personalized marketing moments. Listen, analyze, and act on your customer data with Clavio. Visit clavio.com forward slash 2x. Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, one of the things that our brain tries to do is create a mental model of the world to help us survive. Mm -hmm. And that implies a certain kind of causality. Uh, when I see the certain kind of plants growing, I'm probably closer to a water source. So if I go in that direction, I'll find the river. Those kind mm -hmm. of causal things help me survive. So we always try to put causality on the world. And where that really misfires is where it truly is random, which is why people get addicted to gambling. We're trying to, in our minds, find the pattern of the gambling, and there is none. So we keep putting no. money in and losing it. So uh, that's a very, that's definitely something that people take advantage of it. But we don't do well with truly random things because our minds try to create, even if it's a false uh, relationship, some kind of causality or explanation of it. Yeah, and the interesting thing is it's it's just a segment of us that are like hugely affected by, you know, by 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 patterns and, and so trying to, to break a pattern and that's why you have, you know, compulsive gamblers and on, on, on the one side. Right. Um when I was reading your book, I have a confession. I, I was I was well, not really a confession, but I was I was reading two other books. Um one was um I think it was Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. Yes, and, yes. And you know that one. And the other yeah, one yeah. was... Well, I've talked um, to him about speaking at Nudge, Nudge Stock at his Nudge, conference. And yeah, yeah. yeah. A very good book. Interesting. Again, comes along the lines of what you're talking about, where like, you know, um, marketing and branding and advertising should not be... It's often looked logically. However, you know, um, there's there's magic in it. There, it was pretty much saying emotions. A lot of people are driven by emotions, you know, in, in many, mm -hmm. many ways, in many, many stories on, on the one hand. And on the other, um, there was another book I was reading, um, which was um, You Can't Hold Me Back, I think. Um, it was, was it You Can't Hold Me Back, I think? Yeah, it was. Um, and it was more about um, D David Goggins, who is like an ex-US Marine um, you know, um, you know, soldier and well, Navy, U U.S. You, you, he was a Navy SEAL basically, and, mm -hmm. and he had a, a, a lost career in, in the military, U.S. military, and he's doing you know ultra marathons, and so he was saying the same thing you were saying, but from a from his own experience, you know, in terms of like controlling the brain, and um, you know um, how emotions you know get the better of you, and, and you know he was now giving his own practical experience as to how he's he's been able to sort of you know manage his brain. I, I just I just you know started to bring everything together, and mm -hmm. it, it reinforced the core message of primal you know of unleash your primal brain, which was like we're driven essentially by emotions. And, Absolutely, um, and automatic yeah. responses. Again, that's even some of those are below the emotional level. You don't have yeah, a choice. Exactly. Emotions are tied to past memories and what happened, and so you can uh, act the same way. To, but automatic responses, there is no emotion involved. You just do stuff. Yeah, you're a robot. Yeah. yeah, and so I think just going back to what you were talking about in regards to the hypersocial, um, you know, just thriving socially, you know, th thriving in social groups what's what's what was the concept of like conformity i think you talked about integrity and consistency in, in terms of like you know mm. maintaining that in a social structure um how does that relate to both leadership in a social structure and um being a a good follower you know a good member of a community or a group 
Yeah, as I mentioned, we very much care uh, and are attuned to the people around us, and we mm -hmm. internalize their cultural values and behaviors. So we look, especially in times of uncertainty, uh, to other people to guide our behavior. If we're new to a situation, that's the most formative time of all. Before we have experience with it and internalize the group norms, we just look to the behavior of, of people around us and what they're doing. And so it's a, a key time, especially when you bring people into a group, it's an opportunity to lock them into the group's beliefs. Mm -hmm. And um, we are essentially self-censoring animals as well. We assume the world is governed by some kind of social rules. We may not even understand what they are, but we assume they exist. And we also sanction people around us for not following rules. So the sanctions can take on this escalating scale of, gossiping about people, denying them economic opportunities or mating opportunities. In the more extreme cases, it could be social censure, throwing them out of the group, excommunicating them, or even killing them if, if the offense is bad enough. So we're very much enforcers of social rules and we're self-critical. We look inside of ourselves and say, I need to behave a certain way, even without mm -hmm. people watching. So that, that's a, those are very strong pulls to conform. Mm -hmm. Okay, so w what is the 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 takeaway for for marketers? You know, listening to to this in, in terms of like you know building a community. I think community building is pretty much the new marketing, isn't it? It's it's the only way to sort of sustain the longevity of, you know, loyalty with, with your brand now, you know, in, in 2021 and moving forward. Um, so, so what, what learnings from, from neuroscience, from your work, um, can, can marketers, you know, take away to, to what's, you know, building that, um, you know, what, what you just said? Well, the broad mass market brands, again, they're very hard to build. They're very expensive to build. You probably can't mm -hmm. displace Coca-Cola or Apple or some of these companies mm -hmm. or Marlboro and for, for an addictive cigarette brand, but <laughs> because they're so established, most of us don't have those kind of businesses. So if anything, I say, go in the direction, in the opposite direction, don't go for the broad market, go for intimate knowledge of a bunch of micro segments. You have to understand your audience. That's where it begins and ends. Once you know who your audience is, understand their values, understand the cultural stories they tell, what they care about. And only then can you design the right messaging to speak to them. So there's no such thing in my mind as a mass market. Uh, the smart play is to have a bunch of little micro markets that aggregate together into a larger business. But you should be talking to me in my language so it resonates for me as a member of that group. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so speaking of Coca-Cola, um, in the in the US, um, there's there's a brand called Hint Water, and mm -hmm. in the UK, there's another brand called Dash Water. And what they're doing really is they're, they're they're launching an attack on on soda, you know, by going for the more healthy, conscious people who still want to have that feel of you know drinking soda, um, by bringing this flavored type of water. And you know they're they're going for micro niches in terms of their their targeting, and it's working. As in, they're getting a lot of they're capturing a lot of the market. Obviously, not at the scale of Coca Cola, but you know, as you said. Um, they're, they're going specifically to certain verticals, whether it's yoga, you know, wh whether it's, uh, you know, people who are doing hits and, and they're just capturing, you know, segments of those markets. And, you know, by the time it accumulates, you know, over time, um, it surely does. Yes. And one of the things that there's a tipping point that we know from uh, social science is that if it's one thing to spread awareness of something, you can think mm -hmm. of that like a virus spreading. Yeah, you can. I'm aware of things. But if you want to actually change my behavior one of the things that you want to do is to start in my immediate circle and get about a quarter of the people in my group to adopt the behavior. And then there's a tipping point and everybody adopts it. Below that 25% adoption, it looks like nothing's happening and it's, it's just you're beating your head against the wall. But as soon as you get to that 25% of my circle doing it, then it takes off. So again, think about what little groups you can tip. How do you get um, people doing it, badging you, would, it, talking would, about it publicly and so on? So this is not influencer marketing because influencers- That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this is the difference. So influencers are an example of that kind of weak contagion of just information spread. So they mm. can make someone aware of something. 
but they're not going to be the ones that adopt new behaviors because they have so much social reputation to protect that they'd be stupid for them to go out on a limb and to take a risky position. They're going to be kind of late adopters, and then they'll help evangelize it, but they're not going to be the people that get you to change the behavior in the first place. So, so what are the cues, the psychological cues, or you know, what are the cues in general to get that feeling that 25% of this group of people you know, have, you know, uh, have undertaken this habit or doing this, this thing, w would that, you know, be in terms of reviews? H how does it play out in, you know, in a very digital um, world? Well, uh, for example, there are badges that you could put around your social media photos. I have one right now that says, you know, when it's my turn, I'm getting the vaccine. Mm. Uh, so I'm publicly saying that and standing for it. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a lot of people to to spread that behavior, uh, that was actually, um, I was asked to put that particular thing on by Kelly Peters, who runs a behavioral economics consultancy, and mm -hmm. she's trying to get people to adopt vaccines, and it's a great move. So it's an example like that. So you uh, badging of various kinds, signs, the, you know, politically there are lawn signs of people that are... Um, willing to stand for something yeah. you know, for one side or another. So the mm -hmm. cheapest thing you can do politically is to go around to literally every house that you think will do it and give them a lawn sign. And all of a sudden there's all this public badging uh, for your position and, and there's a certain momentum and inevitability to it. Mm. And so on your websites, I guess you'd also want to make people aware of, you know, um, how adoption is growing with numbers and photos yes. and, and on social media also. Yeah. So, so for example, if you, I, if you've probably seen these signs when you take your dog for a walk, a lot of people on their lawn say, don't poop here or something like that. Yes. Yes. But, but that's the wrong message because what you want to say is most people don't poop on our lawn. That's the right message. So again, yeah. you want to take advantage of, um, social proof of a lot of people doing it, of that being the default behavior. If you say, you know, please pick up after your pet, uh, that's not taking advantage of the social proof. Yeah, instructional, you know, it's a command, but if, you know, you're yeah, saying, but the, the, don't the, be the, the implication is most people don't do that, and exactly. so it's okay for, for me to let my dog poop on your lawn. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, once, you, once you create that group of people that, you know, the normal people do this, you know, are you abnormal? Then, you know, it, it, it stands out. Some really, really interesting, you know, insights in terms of um, all that you've, you've said. Um, so just wrapping, wrapping up, um, what, what are the next steps? Um, and what final words do you, or, or final, you know, um, nuggets of, of knowledge and wisdom um, do, do you have to, pretty much a direct to consumer e-commerce industry um, well audience um, on on this um, you know podcast um, in, in relation to um, you know unleash your primal brain and um, you know um, just build in meaningful brands you know that, yeah that, so uh, one of the keys to remember is that um, the default mode of the brain is to do nothing it's to conserve energy it's to keep doing the same thing it's always been doing it's not to change so your biggest job as a marketer is to overcome that momentum, what we call in behavioral economics, the status quo bias of just keep doing the same thing. And in order to move me off my comfortable spot and to create value for that change you're asking me to do, you have to create a contrast. And there's two ways to do that. You can do upside stuff by saying, uh, oh, you'll have a great outcome if you do this. You'll win the lottery, you'll be rich. Or you can use downside fear and loss avoidance is actually about twice as powerful as upside. <laughs> so a lot of marketers make the mistake of being the nice brand. We don't say mm -hmm. mean things. We don't say negative things. In fact, if you want to motivate people and make them uncomfortable and make them value whatever it is you're selling or offering, you need to make them uncomfortable with staying on the same path. And mm -hmm. the best way to do that is through pain and rubbing salt into the wound. <laughs> Sounds like politics to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's effectively used in politics, that's for sure. <laughs> Tim, it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Two X Ecos podcast. Um, it's so um, Unleash Your Primal Brain is out um, already. Yes. 
It's available everywhere. Ebook, mm-hmm. uh, audiobook narrated by me, as well as the, the paperback. Um, if you want additional information, including the full table of contents, just go to primalbrain.com. Okay. And well, uh, link- for information about my keynote speaking or digital marketing advisory, you can just visit timash.com. Okay. What, so what social media platforms are you most active on? I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook and a little bit on Twitter, and that's about all I have time for. We all have to pick and choose. So don't look for me on Clubhouse. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. And um, you, you also advise them um, to stay off <laughs> social media and, you know, put your phone down and, you know, really socialize at the end of your book. Um, Tim, we'll link to, to your, your social media handles, um, to, 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 to your book website and, um, you know, where to, to, to get it on. Um, uh, many, many thanks for, for coming on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I also thoroughly enjoyed reading the book. It's timeless and very useful and I will be, you know, referencing it over and over again. Thank you. Oh, it's been my absolute pleasure. 